Yeah, so um, um, this is my first interview with someone in the art crime field and art law field. So I guess my first question is, what does your job as an art crime attorney involve? So, I mean, first of all, I hope this doesn't disappoint you, but I'm not per se an art crime attorney. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I like to uh, keep criminal law out of my practice. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I started out and I think it's an interesting history because I have such a history of being almost one of the first generation of art lawyers and vintage art law. I started out really as an art lawyer representing artists and their, uh, their position in the art world and developing art law that suited their needs. I then fast forwarded, became the chair of the City Bar Association Art Law Committee. And uh, at that time, my colleagues who were all represented on the committee were suing each other. I mean, their clients were suing each other mm -hmm. and they were representing what would be called source nations, which are countries that are very rich in archeological materials. Mm -hmm. And that can include countries such as Italy or France, mm -hmm. but it can also include, and what was where the whole issue started to come up with respect to looted art mm -hmm. it included countries in south america mm -hmm. central america africa and asia who were also very very rich in both archaeological sites and antiquities mm -hmm. so my colleagues on the committee included lawyers who were at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and lawyers suing the Metropolitan Museum for Art. In this particular case, it was for the return of what was called the Lydian Horde, which were antiquities that were housed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but that were claimed to have been stolen from Turkey. I see. And there were all kinds of disputes that were really going on. And the US policy also at that time was again, with respect to cultural heritage, very divided between the art dealers and the museums on one side and the people representing the nations that had those those artifacts and possessions. Mm -hmm. So I put together what was called the cultural the cultural uh, property roundtable with the view to getting these people to talk to each other and together. Okay. Yeah. At that time, there really weren't, I mean, there might have been a few cases, but you're really looking in the 90s at the beginning of the whole litigation over cultural property and cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. So while there might have been cases before, there really wasn't a developed body of law and there weren't really art lawyers yeah. <laughs> that were developing um, theories or the US government developing theories that would in fact enable people to go after in many cases, with the help of the United States government on the side 
of people who were claiming the property had been stolen. Um, um, cultural property that, quote, had been stolen. And certainly not cultural property that was, shall we say, laundered by being in a museum. Mm -hmm. In other words, it wasn't like a mafia laundering the way you look at it now. Yeah. But for many people, including the lawyer from Turkey, the idea that this Lydian hoard was at the Metropolitan Museum was the equivalent of laundering because mm -hmm. that gave it a legitimacy. Mm -hmm. And it was only by bringing lawsuits and the development of legal theories that would enable them to recover those properties. And of course, one of the major issues in any such case um, for a lawyer, and I know that um, you're just at the very, very beginning of like thinking about being a lawyer mm -hmm. in, in, your, in your legal and sort of uh, path to, to enlightenment, shall we say, in the law. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether you know of the concept or, you know, I'm sure you might just in general, of the statute of limitations, which is basically that you can't really go after something usually in the law or bring a lawsuit about anything um, unless there are exceptions, unless it's brought within a certain period of time. So just for yourself and your friends reading the newspapers, I'm sure, a lot of the issues that have come up that have dealt with, say, say, sex predators or uh, Me Too movement and other things and looted antiquities has to deal with the fact that many of these things happened a long time ago, right? Mm -hmm. So the law in general doesn't like people to bring lawsuits many, many, many years after the matter has happened and it's called a statute of limitations and it's written into the law there are all you know, there are all different statutes of limitations if you've heard of contracts right yeah if somebody breaches a contract to you mm -hmm. and you know you've entered into that contract with the person and now and you know you've been thinking and i mean i'm just saying you but this happens a lot you know, people think and think and think about it. And since a lot of us have no sense of time, even before COVID, you know, people will say, this has really been bothering me, you know, and they'll call up their lawyer. I think this person really breached this contract with me and I really want to sue them. And the lawyer will say, well, when did that happen? Hmm. I think it was like 10 years ago. The lawyer said, what? <laughs> you know, so the question of looted antiquities, you can imagine, is not only a what, you know, 10 years ago, like when was that taken from your country? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. when? Like 300 years ago? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 200 years ago, and you want to see to get it back. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, those early cases really raise issues, not only of theft, but when the theft occurred and when people knew about it, okay? So I'm, go I'm sort of focusing you in a period of time, say in the 80s or 90s, when a body of law did develop using both the statute of limitations, which in New York is a state law, statute for all of theft is a state issue it's not a federal issue it can become federal if something is stolen under the definition of a of a federal statute but things are not um in general if if you know somebody robs you on the street of new york um or there is a general theft from your house it's really what we consider state law. Crimes are state mm -hmm. law uh, matters. 
and it only takes a certain kind of overlay and um, enactment by the federal government to make crimes federal. Like if you read in the paper of the federal, you know, crimes like a civil rights act or depriving people of their rights under the federal statutes. Mm -hmm. All of those become federal crimes because there are federal laws. But in general, criminal law is a state law matter. And so under New York law, New York developed a statute of limitations, which said that the statute of limitations for stolen art doesn't begin to, to start to tick tock down mm -hmm. until the original owner, in this case, it would be Turkey, demands that the person who now has it return it. So mm -hmm. that's huge, right? Because instead of the way normally you would think of it, like, well, this was taken from Turkey, even if it was stolen 200 years ago, mm -hmm. it's too bad, Turkey, you know, you're out of the ballpark. Mm -hmm. But if it, if the statute doesn't begin to run until Turkey says, hey, you know, I'm a good lawyer, we've been doing a lot of research. Mm -hmm. And we now know that the Metropolitan Museum has work that came out of Turkey 200 years ago, but we just found out about that. And we've been looking all this time. Mm -hmm. So we're now asking that you, the Metropolitan Museum, give that back, okay? So that whole way of thinking about cultural property and changing it, you know, to be something that was more protective of the original owners really started in about the late 80s and it got cemented in New York with the revelation that Holocausts occurred and many, many people lost their art involuntarily. So many people who are on the boards of museums, like the Met, are Jewish. Mm -hmm. And they realize that the law, or from the point of view of the law, they were original owners if they wanted their property back. And so Holocaust victims who had unlawfully been deprived of their works of art by the Nazis um, basically were in the same position as people, I mean, countries like Turkey or Italy or Africa, who also were the original owners. Hmm. So suddenly, the Metropolitan Museum and other countries I mean, other countries, other other lawyers representing other things, and the Art Dealers Association, you know, that were opponents mm -hmm. of criminal procedures against institutions or going after these institutions changed. Mm -hmm because everybody realized that they were in the same boat with the same laws that were not suited to them. Mm. So then bodies of law began to develop that did enable art lawyers to work with um, the federal government, the FBI, mm. to solve art crimes whether they were in the making, uh, had happened uh, to enable original owners to get the works back because they had been, quote, stolen, okay? 
And so that's how, when you really look at the evolution of all of that, um, in terms of cultural heritage, an art lawyer now has been involved in the development of laws and uh, theories of law that permit him or her to be an art lawyer and mm -hmm. in, in, in some cases work with people like the FBI or Homeland Security to go after people for art crimes. Mm -hmm. So it's important to know that historically that wasn't always the case because of such obstacles like the statute of limitations, which said in the case of theft, three years from the theft or contracts, six years from the contract, which changed and got nuance to permit actions. Another thing that changed from the federal thing, because we talked about state crimes and federal crimes, mm -hmm. and this is again, you know, how from the James Bond side of it, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, like, all right, what does an art crime lawyer do? Mm -hmm. um, have made it easier because we have something called the National Stolen Property Act, which is a federal law. Okay, so remember, usually crimes, as I told you, are state law. So if you steal something, it's the uh, district attorney's office and the New York place, police that are going to go after you and you're going to be tried in criminal court mm -hmm. under New York laws. Okay, if you murder somebody, you're going to be tried under New York's criminal laws. Okay, mm -hmm. and you're going to be tried before a New York jury in a New York court. Mm -hmm. If you steal something from somebody's uh, library or house, it's going to be New York law that applies it's to define the theft. And if you go to prison, it's going to be a New York state prison. Okay. Mm -hmm. But what about all that stuff that's being smuggled in through customs and um you know crossing borders or things that are coming in from Egypt that are painted over or that have false provenance how are we going to get those because they're coming from outside of any state and they don't have New York State doesn't have jurisdiction again the general principle is that one country doesn't enforce the export laws of another country. So for example, if Egypt or Peru says it's illegal to export Peruvian antiquities or to export uh, Egyptian antiquities, that may be illegal under the laws of that country, but it's not something that in New York the customs people or the federal customs people could seize at JFK and say, mm -hmm. well, Egypt told us or Peru told us that anything that's Peruvian has to be stolen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, we're, and it can't be exported. So therefore, since you're on a plane and that plane came from Lima or that plane came from Cairo, you had to have exported it unless you can prove you brought it in and nobody can prove that they brought it in, right? Mm -hmm. So they would be stuck because the law generally is that you can't enforce export laws of another country. So how do we get it? Well, under, the, again, a change in our law from like the 90s is not only the statute of limitations, but the whole idea that we have this national stolen property law mm -hmm. and the national stolen property law is a federal law, but it developed originally to deal with stolen automobiles mm -hmm. that were crossing interstate lines because 
as I told you, criminal law is for a state, right? So if you stole a car in New York and they caught you in New York with that stolen car, no problem, right? Mm -hmm. But if you take that car and you go to New Jersey through the Lincoln Tunnel, mm -hmm. if there is a state law that says, I mean, that it, that applies to people who steal property in New Jersey, mm -hmm. how do they get you? Because you stole that in New York, right? Mm -hmm. So there you are, home free, mm -hmm. sailing in your convertible down, mm -hmm. you know, the New Jersey turnpike saying, ha, 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 I stole mm -hmm. it in New York. But so they invented this law. I mean, they passed this law many, many years ago, probably by the time people were driving from New York to New Jersey, like yeah. in the 50s or 60s. I mean, it's an old law, right? Before any of us were born. And it was called the National Stolen Property Act. And it was a way of getting things that cross state lines, you know, and criminalizing them. So, and having the Fed and making it a federal crime. I see. And so the big debate in the 1980s and the 1990s in the area of, again, art and stolen art was, can the National Stolen Property Act that was meant to catch people who were stealing cars, could that actually be used to go against people who took things in violation of another country's law, not the export law, but their law that said that property that was in the ground, like antiquities, belonged to that country. And if you took it, just like taking a car, mm -hmm. that it was stolen property. Mm -hmm. This country, like Italy or Peru, claimed the ownership of everything that was found in the ground. Egypt, too. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that wasn't an export law, because it didn't say you can't export our cultural property, it just said that Egypt or Peru owns the property, just like you own your car. Mm -hmm. And if somebody takes that property, they have stolen it. Because if you take somebody else's property, it's a theft. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just like stealing a car from somebody who owns it would let another state go after that uh, car and bring it back, no matter where it was stolen. They argued under the National Stolen Property Law that people who stole the property of another country because it was claimed to be theirs because it was owned by them because it was buried in the ground or in antiquity mm. could be prosecuted by the federal government wherever that was found as long as they brought it into the United States. I see. And it took a long time to get everybody on board like the art dealers and other people with that concept. So armed with those weapons of change in law and the statute of limitations, art laws were read art lawyers were ready to jump out of the telephone booth just like Superman mm -hmm. and begin working <laughs> with the police to claim looted art. <laughs> Wow. Whoa. <laughs> wow. So that's like one aspect of it. Do you know what I mean? So the the bottom line is like, you know, 
we really have fun. I mean, I have fun in doing what I'm doing because I represent lots of artists who are very cool. They're not dealing with stolen art. They're dealing with stolen images, which is copyright, you know, and protecting their intellectual property from everybody on social media and other people who grew up thinking that everything in the world was free. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and they're very cool people and I'm trying to help them, you know, get their place in the world. But the whole other aspect of what art lawyers do, you know, is, you know, in terms of cultural heritage is, is really to assist in the recovery and, and develop laws that are useful for the recovery of art that has been stolen either many, many years ago or is in the process of being stolen um, from, from source nations. And then of course, lately art lawyers um, are much more involved since art is an investment instead of you know, looking at it as, an, as a cultural heritage relic and an, a source of identity for people or as a source of, uh, I, uh, creativity for the artist now of course people are looking at it as a source of investment mm -hmm. you know, which is really all about a whole different other set of laws that really are much closer to a corp what a corporate lawyer does uh you know that deals with banking law and securities law and nfts which i'm sure you know about mm -hmm. that are really uh like securities or or other things that had nothing to do with the areas of law that a copyright lawyer like me did early on or criminal law when they started to work with um, mm -hmm. cultural, you know, cultural heritage. So at the end of the day, art law is so interesting because, and art lawyers are so interesting because we're like vessels that are constantly being filled with laws that are being changed and molded to deal with this wonderful universe of creativity of artists and, and objects that are the result of mm. their creativity and cultural civilization's creativity. So how's that? <laughs> wow. Well, well, yeah, well, thank you. I mean, you really... You really explained a lot, so much about art, law, and heritage. I, I really thank you. So, what, so, do you have some questions? Tell me about you. So, this is being recorded, and yeah, how can yeah. we help you? We people in the field ahead of you. <laughs> I mean, really, all I all I wanted was an, an introduction about this field, and I think that you did an amazing job on that. So, thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. But it's good, you know, that you're that you're interested in it. And I was particularly interested in in your uh, particular identity and focus, too, because of, uh, I take it you're Greek, right? Yes, yes. And, you know, the whole idea of uh, of cultural heritage going back to the Greeks and, you know, of course, Greece is a source nation and they were really involved with the whole idea of the Getty Museum and the idea of, I went to the trial in Italy because Italy has been most, most aggressive in, as a source nation, mm -hmm. even though you would think of Italy and Greece as sort of, you know, they were the old cradles of civilization. I mean, Italy has been perhaps one of the most aggressive countries in developing the laws of cultural heritage and um, supporting people. They have the carving, I mean, going back to your thing about working with the art police and the, the Italians have the carabinieri that mm -hmm. are the most uh, uh, skilled in terms of having an art squad. Mm -hmm. And second to them, are the is the U.S. Homeland Security Art Squad people, mm -hmm. but the Carabinieri are very very proud of what they do. They have a whole collection now in Italy of things that they've recovered, um, and so Greece is, has been very vocal, more in terms of what 
could be considered the return of the Parthenon marbles or the Epson marbles, depending on whose side you're on. Mm -hmm. But um, they haven't been as effective in terms of having police and a squad going around and actually recovering yeah. looted artifacts. And so, for example, I went to the trial in Italy of this very well-respected Italian woman, Marion True. Mm. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm Italian. She's a very well-respected curator at the Getty Museum in Italian and Greek art. And she was accused of buying art which she knew was stolen, mm -hmm. particularly from Italy, but some things from Greece. Mm -hmm. And I happened to go to her. She was being tried in absentia. I mean, everybody knew she was never going to go to jail in Italy, you know, but she was sort of being defended by these Italian lawyers, but she never showed up for the trial. She was like sitting in Paris or Malibu or someplace. But I happened to attend the trial in Rome, which is like a criminal trial. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the day that the Carabinieri were testifying about the route that antiquities took to get out of Greece or Italy and then in, get in, through Thailand and then into the market or laundered. Mm. So it's a very interesting area. It's an, in, I think in Greece, as I said, I don't know the number of people who are working in this area, but it's certainly a fascinating area to get involved in and there are so many different aspects of it. And I think probably, you know, there are, you know, there, you know, you, there are many opportunities for you to go and it really combines so many different things. And of course, there's a contemporary Greek art scene too. Of but I, when I was doing this more, uh, and another area that's in the field that some people might not talk to about what, but it, which is a special, special interest of mine has to do with underwater cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. And um, I was invited to speak at a conference that took place in about 2006, which is at the time that the US was bombing um, in Iraq. So I was a little nervous that I was the only American there. <laughs> and uh, I thought, my goodness, you know, they're going, you know, to, why are they thinking that the U.S. is on a Mediterranean conference? But there I was. Mm -hmm. And um, they were trying to do an underwater cultural heritage treaty for the um, Mediterranean. And that's still in the offing. But it's a whole other area that involves admiralty law. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's a... It's a very interesting area of the law, and it involves many, many different areas of the law, all like admiralty law, sales law, copyright law, but with a particular focus on the issues that pertain to the identity of people, their culture, and the creativity of their artists. So that's it. <laughs> uh. Uh, thank you. I, I mean, perfect timing too, because the meeting is about to run out. I don't have the premium. I know. And if you I know. can, if you have any questions that arise, please don't hesitate to reach out if I thank can get further help. Truly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let me know what you end up doing. <laughs> I will. Have a great day. Have you too. Day. Bye. Bye.